You look good. It's setting up. Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the CB10 Parks Committee meeting. Today is September. It's oh, it's still setting up? It's good. Yeah. We're, We're live. live. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll do it again. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Community Board 10 Parks Committee meeting. Today is September the 20th. And um, I'm Diane Gennardis. I'm the, the uh, Parks Committee Chair. And I welcome members of the Parks Committee uh, this evening, along with our, um, our new chair um, from CB10, Jane Marie Kapitanakis. Thank you, Chris Clay and Dave V. Ives and James Morris. And who did I miss? Anybody? I don't think I missed anybody from uh, Parks. Well, welcome everyone. And I'm going to actually um, give a brief overview. I believe that tonight's meeting is an informational meeting only. Um, we are going to get a status of all of the work that is being done um, in our various parks in Community Board 10, as well as um, uh, learn about what the Parks Committee, what the Parks Department feels are our needs uh, for future, pro, uh, future work, future projects. And so without further ado, who am I turning the meeting over to? To Davey. Thank you very much, Davey. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for your time. Um, I also want to thank our manager, Chris Clay, and, uh, and Jim Morris from our office from, for, for being on tonight. Um, I think tonight it's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, what we'll do is we'll, um, Jim prepped a, a presentation for us. So, so I'll, I'll just run through that quickly. Um, in a moment, Jim will share his screen and we'll just pull that up and go over the details for all the capital parks, capital projects happening in community board 10. Um, if you want, we can also then talk about the needs. I know that, um, Josephine sent over a list of needs. I think it was about 10 sites or something like that, that we could kind of, they're in various states of, of development. So we could kind of maybe go through that one by one. Um, I have a list of that here. So maybe afterwards, and then obviously, you know, this is your time as well. So we're, we're here for you guys. So any, any questions that you might have, just let us know, um, work through issues, stuff like that. Sound good? Great. Sounds great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Jim, do you want to share? Can you share? Yeah, just give me one second. Okay. So we'll give Jim a minute. And Jim, if you have trouble, I think I, never mind, I, we're all good. Okay. Jim, would it be possible to go full screen on this? There we go. Uh, control L maybe, try that. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. Um, right. So I think you guys all know where Community Board 10 is. So next slide. Um, and we can send this. So Dorothy, we'll, we'll send this to you guys um, after the meeting. So you guys have it. I think uh, we have it already. We have or, it. Oh, yeah, you probably have it. have it already because we just went through it um, on Thursday with all the community boards. We sent out um, the, the, the capital status to all the community boards after our budget consultation meeting. Right. Um, all right. So the first one is, um, I think we all know the, the field was done a couple of years ago, um, but this summer we finally opened the, the two tennis courts and the basketball courts um, at Fort Hamilton. Um, so I think these are, these are ready to roll. I don't know if anyone's been playing on them yet, but they were beautiful. Um, and we had a couple of drainage issues that we had to iron out, but, um, you know, through Jim and our contractors, they were able to resolve it and kind of layer it up in certain areas to pitch the water. Um, so if you do notice anything in the next year, the contractor is still on the hook. So the it's what we call the guarantee period. So if you do see drainage after at these sites after, well after a rainstorm, just let us know. We can uh, flag it for the contractor. All right, next slide. All right, so now getting to Shore Road, there, there's a lot of work happening in Shore Road. Um, this is the dog run project. It's, um, I think it's by like about the 103rd street. I know I'm going to get that wrong. Uh, and sure, right, right at the entrance to the, the belt right there. Um, so 
Yeah, this one started over the summer uh, and is a one year project. So we expect it to be wrapped up by the next summer. So this will be a fully functional dog run with um, synthetic doggy turf, which is state of the art. Um, and, you know, it'll have drinking fountains for dogs at the doggy bowl. Um, and, you know, and a little bit of lawn area as well um, to accommodate the trees. So, all right, next slide. All right, this next one is a uh, paving project in Shore Road. So it's actually on that bottom image, if you can picture it, um, the bo very bottom of the page is the Belt Parkway. Um, so it's actually restoring a, a path around those two baseball diamonds um, closer to the, the parkway. Um, Unfortunately, the timing worked out where they started construction just after we opened that building at 90, 95th Street. Um, so um, I think, you know, we, we worked with the different contractors to make sure that the bathrooms will be accessible um, to park users during construction. So it's a little bit of a funky situation, but those are all, um, we, we managed to keep those buildings, the bathrooms open. Um, again, this project started during the summer and we expect it to be a one-year project and wrap up next summer. Uh, next slide. All right, the next one. This is a big one. And I think we came back to you guys in the, I think we came back to you guys in the spring with this project last spring. Um, uh, we had a joint community board 10, community board 11 meeting that went really well. Um, this is a project to restore um, part of the, just to restore the seawall along, um, um, along the waterfront next to the Shore Parkway. Um, so this is actually, so it's not gonna be completely redoing the wall. It's actually just gonna be patching up some of the stones um, that are in the worst condition. And then it's also gonna be um, fixing up some DEP outfalls that are concrete that, that drain out into the bay um, that are in pretty rough shape. So um, this is going to be a slightly longer, I think we, uh, longer design period, certainly, because uh, it's a lot of engineering and, uh, and, and waterfront reviews. Uh, but we're hoping that sometime next spring, we'll be able to wrap up the design. And then it'll probably start construction in the spring of 2024. Um, I think this might be a slightly longer than a one year project, even though we have it listed as one year. Um, but we can, uh, we'll, we'll get more information as we get closer to the end of the design process. Um, next slide. Okay, so back to shore, hopping back to Shore Road, Vinland Playground is desperately in need of, um, in need of work. Um, Chris Clay, I don't know the exact cross streets of this. I want to say maybe like 90. Uh, the entrance is on Oliver and, but the park is around 93rd, 94th. Got it. Okay, great. So this is that small little playground. Um, it had a number of flooding issues where this, where all the water pipes were like 14 feet underground. We don't have to worry, but we won't have to worry about that, uh, anymore. Um, Hopefully the plan is for next spring, spring of 2023, uh, we're gonna start construction. This is again, a one year construction project. Um, so we'll, we'll see this. Um, probably, I don't know, we don't know who the contractor is at the moment. Oops, one more thing. We don't know who the contractor is at the moment for this one, but um, likely they're going to be hauling in all the materials in the same way um, that the previous, the dog run and the path projects have so far. So there will be minor disruptions in other parts of the park, but um, the majority of the work is gonna happen over here. All right, next slide. Okay, Quaker Parrot Field uh, at the Dust Bowl. Um, this is what we call a state of good repair or limited scope type of project. So it's a much faster timeline, fortunately. Um, but it's just a smaller scope of work. So this, they're basically just redoing the synthetic turf and fixing some drainage problems. This project started in the summer uh, and we hope to have it wrapped up by the end of the fall. So we're really excited about this, uh, this project. And we've, we've been coordinating with all the leagues on, um, that, that have permits there to either give them time or make sure that they'll, they'll have their space when they come back. Next slide. All right, Russell Pedersen, so right next to Fort Hamilton, 
Um, this is to redo that whole entire playground, which is definitely, definitely tired. Um, unfortunately, it does not include the basketball court or the handball courts, um, nor does it include the bathroom, but it is the, the entire playground and we're really fortunate um, that we're able to get this funding. So um, next spring, it's another project that's gonna start in the district. So you have a lot of stuff happening next spring um, that's gonna go under construction. Uh, next slide. Um, this one is also estimated to start in the spring. Um, this is JJ Cardi Park. Again, thank you to, to Council Member Brandon for the funding on this one. Um, this is another very tired project. A lot of, um, you know, a lot of play equipment that's just dated and has seen better days. Um, it's, it'll hopefully start in the spring of next year and it'll be a one year project. Um, not included in it, we are not gonna be touching the, the building as part of this project. Um, but if, if we can, we might be touching it, seeing what we can do with in-house forces to kind of maybe fix up some things in the bathroom to make it a little bit brighter and cleaner. Next slide. Okay, this is, all right, jumping over to Alice Head Park. This is similar to Quaker Parrot. This is a limited scope or state of repair project. Um, and that's to redo the paths network in um, Alice Head Park. In the diagram on the screen, you can kind of see some areas in blue. Um, our intention is to phase the project so that all the paths in Alice Head are not closed at the same time. Um, so roughly we were thinking that there'd be one phase on the eastern side of the park, that section in red, um, that would be the first bit that goes during construction. And then the contractor would remobilize after completing the work on the, on the west side of the park with the yellow, the work in yellow. So um, if all goes according to plan, that will also start in the spring of 2023 um, and it'll be completed in the fall. Uh, next slide. Okay, staying in Alzheimer Park. I think we brought this to you guys recently. Recently. Um, so this was, we actually got funded to do the basketball courts at Alzheimer Park. And then we also got funded to do the playground at Alzheimer Park. And what we did was we combined them into the same contract. So um, what, what that does is that gets us a better price for bidders um, that will look at it. So hopefully, um, you know, it will get done in the, bit faster as well, which, um, which is always a good thing. Um, so our hope is that by fall of 2023, we're gonna start this project. So basically, and sometime before the end of next year, um, we're gonna be kicking off this project, which is very exciting. Um, we've had a couple of COVID related delays on this, um, which affected projects citywide um, or projects all across the city, I should say, um, but we are excited Definitely excited for this one. And I know that um, Chris and his staff are excited to see this one with a, a better spray shower and just kind of a new facelift, I would say. All right, next slide. Okay, McKinley Park, this is a really exciting one. Um, we had a scope meeting in May of this year um, and it's that purple area um, that, that you can kind of see. Um, so this project is just to do the basketball courts and to expand them and to redo all the play equipment and expand the, the play area. So we're excited about this project, another site where it's just a very tired playground, um, well used. So what we're, we're looking to start construction sometime in the spring of 2024. So a year from uh, spring, um, basically, yeah. Um, and that's it. And I think included in this, I think we got some three or one calls. We are gonna try to redo the bocce court area too. Uh, I know that we've had some community um, requests for that to um, disappear. All right, next slide. Okay, Diker Beach. There's a lot of work that's actually happening at Diker Beach. So this is- Maybe, excuse me, I just want to interrupt. You're going to have to change the address on that one. This one? It's not 81st Street. Diker well, Beach Park oh, is- Sorry about that. Just so that you know. Just yeah, so it's 86. Apologies. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you for catching that, Diane. Um, okay, so we are working on the project on, on this now. This is going to be done- um, 
similarly with kind of replacement and kind uh, state of good repair funding. Um, so they have a number of contracts that are open at the moment. So we're going to try to make it happen sometime in 2023. So sometime next year, this is just to replace some of the path work, the network uh, within the park. It's really, really bad. So, um, so I think some of the, the pathway, I can get you more specific details if you want on which paths, um, but you know, it's just gonna be the path network in the park. Um, I think additionally, we're also gonna look outside of uh, the, look at the sidewalk that fronts the park and try to replace some individual um, flags as needed. Cause I think there are a couple bad spots. We don't have quite enough money to do the whole sidewalk area, but we're going to, you know, just do the worst areas that really need attention. Um, yeah, and if we get more money, or if or if the bids come in such that um, we can we can stretch it, we're going to try to have them do as much work as possible. All right, uh, next slide. Okay. Um, I think okay, so. At, this is along 86th Street. Um, there's that big asphalt area. We call it a multi-purpose play area or an MPPA. Um, this this has some soccer lines drawn on there. We're gonna re, re, we're gonna basically we get some money um, to re, do repaving. This is another state of good repair project. Um, we're gonna be repaving um, the whole asphalt area as well as the basketball courts. So the basketball courts will get brand new lines, brand new paint, um, and I believe backboards are included as the, in the project as well. Um, yeah, I see Jim nodding his head, so yes. So this, uh, we're hoping to start again, spring 2023, uh, and then it should be completed by the end of the year. All right, uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, Patrick O'Rourke Playground, this is, I, I don't know the name of the school is attached to, but is it is attached to a school? IS-201. IS-201, IS yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, so this one, so we get, Jim, is this green infrastructure funding? Uh, it's a mixture of state of good repair and infrastructure. Okay, so uh, for those, so if, if, if people want to know, sometimes we, we've started this partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, um, to have them come into parks and build what's called green infrastructure uh, in parklands. Um, so basically, these they're essentially what they are, underground holding tanks to just retain water so that in the heavier storms and heavier rainstorms, not all the water rushes into the, whatever the, the water treatment plants uh, and it gives them time. And then kind of those retention tanks in the park allow it to seep out over time. Um, that is able to um, take the load off some of the waste water treatment plants and reduce what's called combined sewer overflows. Chris, did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say what you just said. I mean, they're, they're basically big holding tanks underground that uh, during major storm events, they keep you from having too much storm water running off into the sewage treatment plants and overloading them. And then sometimes they either seep out or they pump them out at a later date. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think they're, they're a great thing uh, to do, but I think they're not exactly like a very flashy project. So the good news for us is we have a lot of asphalt areas that need to be resurfaced. So We've partnered with DEP on this project at O'Rourke where we've thrown in some of our money. They've thrown in some of their money. We're gonna be putting a retention tank underground and then we're also gonna be resurfacing the whole court. Jonathan, did you have a question? Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, I would like to just kind of ask about these holding tanks. So uh, you wouldn't know this, but uh, sewage and wastewater was a hot topic last night at our community board meeting and although you may not think that this is a flashy topic this would probably be very well received by the community that lives near these near this park so just from my own understanding these tanks would essentially in theory prevent in a major storm sewage flooding back into homes like potentially stopping that from happening because the water would be able to collect inside of them? 
In theory, yes. I, 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 I'm, I'm putting a like a disclaimer on that because I don't want to say like if you put this in the park that's like ten blocks sure. from your house, it's not going to solve everything. But the idea is that by implementing these at scale a number of different places, you're going to be able to take on more rainwater um, out of the system and reduce okay. that. Uh, then. It depends. Oh, sorry. One more thing. It depends why your your house is getting backed up with with sewage. You know, it could be the water very local to your your house, like the drain closest to your house could be filled with leaves and garbage and whatever. So that's what's causing it. It could sure. be the system larger is experiencing overflow every elsewhere, and water is trying to get out, and it's just finding your house. So. so Maybe, and this is, you know, for the board as well, you know, maybe if we could potentially get some more information about how these tanks are going to operate, because it's, it's a bandaid on a much, on a, on a bigger issue that obviously the parks department has is, it doesn't have anything to do with, but if it is a bit of a solution that maybe as the board, we can get this information to the Diker Heights uh, Civic Association, which obviously brought all of those concerned uh, neighborhood folks to the meeting last night, and then that information could get doled out to them so that they could know that in the next, uh, in the spring of 2023, these tanks are getting put in. And although it's not a massive fix to the sewers, it is something that could prevent some homes from being flooded. I think that would probably be greatly appreciated information after seeing last night's meeting. Okay. Thank yeah, and you. I, I just wanted to jump on to Jonathan. Um, I think we should absolutely maybe um, encourage the uh, environmental committee for CB10 to maybe reach out to the DEP because um, I do know also that I feel like this this um, uh, retention uh, system, which I'm, I'm actually quite familiar with, um, they are really useful in, in delaying overflow. Um, usually uh, everything I've read is really more about the sewerage treatment and avoiding CSO over uh, outfalls um, during times of intense weather. I haven't heard of it um, affecting like backflow, um, but that does seem like it is a possible thing. So I think we should reach out to the DEP on that because I also know that this area is probably a, a target area for the DEB because I know this was also targeted for those um, uh, storm water, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, bioswale interventions on the street to reduce overflow on nearby streets. I know Diker was a target for that. Um, so it's probably part of the same project. Uh, so this is just for internally, not for parks, but definitely for uh, the rest of CB10, probably uh, move this over to environmental and uh, see if we can't uh, piggyback off this. Jane? Yes, I, I agree as um, our other two board members um, have raised the issue. This was something that definitely is of great interest to the residents around there. I see also that it is something that was funded by the mayor's office. According to this, it says it had mayoral funding. And the residents were really quite concerned that, and, and just for our uh, agency members who are here tonight, we were hearing from residents on 81st Street and 82nd Street and around 10th Avenue and 11th Avenue uh, about the issues they have with uh, water getting into their homes and actually raw sewage getting into their homes and the uh, challenges to their quality of life and just their day-to-day uh, -day living and how, how difficult it is for them to deal with this during every storm. And it's um, concerning too that the mayor's office recognizes that this is an area that needed looking into and needed repair where it came to a, the playground area but there are residents on uh, just about a block away that are actually crying and with frustration about getting this done on their block. So I, I really like to see how we can lift this up and use this as a point of discussion. Thank you. Chris, you had your hand up? No, I did, I'm good now, thank you. <laughs> I, have, I have one more question if that's okay. Yeah, John. These, um, 
these tanks that you're putting in here, there is it a million for for two? I I don't know. I think that one million figure also covers the repaving of the whole asphalt area, restriping it, um, and doing the, the asphalt thing. courts. Yeah. So in bed -Stuy, so I think. I don't want to speak on behalf of DEP, but my understanding is the program is targeting um, sewer sheds that are combined, uh, where where you know basically you have one pipe where your sewage and the rainwater goes in. The newer systems are you know kind of like 1950s and on are separated, where it's the drains on your street go into one area, and then whatever the sewer connection at your house goes into it own pipe yeah. um, that's the preferred system when it's in the same pipe what happens is you know if on a dry day 10 percent of that pipe is filled up with sewage and whatever kind of happens to make its way into the drains when you get a huge rainstorm event like yesterday um, that's very sudden and kind of flash floods everything um, then that pipe 10 percent suddenly goes to like 120 percent yeah um and then you have all this excess water that's spilling into the the what so i think dep is like federally obligated to kind of clean up waterways and that's yeah. where they're getting some of this this money from so it might say mayoral but it's kind of channeled from other well sources. where i'm going with this is that we have flooding issues in our community board in yeah. our area between Diker and Bay Ridge. And what we what is probably unfortunately not possible is ripping up all of the streets and fixing the hundred year old sewer system. Oh God, but yeah. what we do have is a lot of green space that if these tanks could be put in in more parks, could they potentially stop this massive flooding issue that we're having in our community board because it's in Diker, but it's also in Bay Ridge. Like uh, here on, I'm on 94th between uh, uh, third and fourth, just two blocks down, my buddy on Marine and Shore, his basement flooded. So, it, but there's basketball courts everywhere. So if it's a mat and, and, it's not cheap, but in the scheme of everything that you've been presenting, it seems like one million is on the lower end of what things are costing. If these tanks are able to potentially not stop the flooding, but make it less worse, you know, maybe this is something that as a community board, we should look into putting more of these tanks in more of the parks because we have the space for it. Yeah. Do these, do these um, tanks have to be put under asphalt or can they also be put under regular dirt they can go under uh, any surface you know i think um asphalt's probably maybe i don't know what's better but i mean i think um it's just yeah i i, I don't really know uh which one is i wouldn't say one's better than the other but um you know, it just it has to do with kind of the local topography of wherever you're putting it and, and the size of the tank. Yeah. You know, so many of our projects um, are dealing with um, basketball courts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, if there is federal funding for this, for this project, um, it would behoove us, I guess, to find out whether or not we could increase the funding, you know, through a different line or the federal line or whatever, a mayoral line to be able to also put those tanks in, in the various other parks in the um, uh, yeah. basketball courts that are, are currently um, either being renovated or plan to be renovated. Yeah. I think, Diane, we have tons of, I'm not, poor condition asphalt, I'll say, just to put it nicely, mm -hmm. um, where we would love to do tanks more at more places. Um, I think J Jim is, is Diker, the asphalt area, Diker also a green infrastructure site. Do you know? So it's the same contract as this one. It is, it is. So yeah, if you go back one slide. 
Sorry, just one second. So the the one I didn't actually mention it, but the one at um, the one at Diker Beach is actually that asphalt area. The where the I guess there are soccer lines drawn on it. Um, that's actually getting a tank as well. So that's the way we were able to Great. fund it. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'd like to also clarify, I guess, for anyone watching and, and also for the board, like the, these stormwater detention tanks, they they affect a, a wide area because it's really not about the location. Um, and they're actually hard to place in a lot of situations because they can't have load bearing buildings above them, things like that. They're usually entirely reserved for, for parkland or areas that, that can't be built on. Um, and they're, they're very, um, their placement is critical in terms of um, their height level. Um, their elevation and topography and how they might intersect major sewer lines that are nearby to divert some of that extra water into their retention tanks. And then they kind of, it's all happening below ground and it has a wide range, um, really depends on where they are. And they, they can have an effect, you know, blocks and blocks away, obviously. Um, so this would, I mean, it's, I think that we have a lot of open space in um, CB10. Uh, it's really great to see that there are already two. Um, I think we definitely just have to start thinking about, get get an actual idea of what the sewerage lines look like in the area and their topography, their height, where they're running downhill. And if there are any uh, nearby open park areas that need asphalt that are along those lines. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments on this? Didn't think okay. it was so flashy, but it is. Yeah, I thought this was going to be an innocuous kind yeah, of. No. You, know, you never you, know. You had to be at the meeting last night. <laughs> it was the topic of the day last night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Jim, do we have any more slides, or is that it? I think that's all that I have here. Uh, I think yeah, that's 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 the last one. Yeah, it's typically harder to sell those tanks. I mean, it was an easy sell for, yeah. for this community. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, I I, I feel for the DP team because they're they're trying to do as much as they can. Um, you know, with with whatever funding they can scrap together. Um, we're trying to partner with them in, in other ways because, you know, when they first started this program, they would just repave a, a basketball court and leave it with the same junky basketball hoops and not paint lines. And we were like, what's going on here? So, so we started um, trying to partner with them on these projects to try to, you know, make it a more complete park project and rather than just kind of an infra a DEP infrastructure project. So we, we are talking with them more, but um, yeah, definitely the folks at DEP are, are looking into it. Why are they normally a hard sell, the tanks? I, I think because DEP only has funding to do the infrastructure. So for them to do like, color seal coat and basketball hoops is tough for them to justify as like water treatment things. Oh, so like they'll just put the tank in and put a, put asphalt back over it, but it looks the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you want to move on to what you feel are our uh, projected needs? Um, sure, yeah, I think, I'm just going to pull it up on my phone, but I printed out at the office, but then I forgot it. Um, so I'm just going to look it up now. Um, yeah, I think Dorothy said, I mean, how do you want me to go through this? Do you want me just to? Do you have the slides? You don't have it. You don't have it. Okay. Um, Got it, okay. It starts with John Paul Jones. I'm gonna read out all the sites and let me know if this, this makes sense. We have John Paul Jones, Shore Road Perimeter Sidewalks, Leaf Erickson Park, McKinley Comfort Station, McKinley Park, Bocce area. Um, are these coming, are these- No, oh, that's not what I have. That's not, okay. you I, have, have, I like the McKinley um, Comfort Station. One. Um, oh, okay. I, I have here John Paul Jones Park. I have Diker Beach Park, Bay 8th Street. Um, this is so you, um, phase three and phase four. Got it. Um, I have Shore Road Park, 95th Street, Ball Fields. Got it. 
um, the 101st Street Comfort Station. Okay. Uh, Peter, uh, Russell Peterson Playground again. I guess this is phase two. And that would be the handball and the basketball courts. Um, so what up, maybe Dorothy, do you have that document digitally? I have it, but I don't think it's on this computer. Give me a oh, second. I, I can pull it up if you want me to. Um, so I don't think I, so I can't even minimize the Zoom. I can't even do oh, that. Don't worry I'm about it. Don't worry about mm -hmm. it. Uh, what I will do is I have the, the top capital needs is the name of the document. Um, yeah, John Paul Jones, Tyker Bay 8th, Patrol Road. Yeah. So let me, um, or Jim, can you access that email? Okay. Uh, can you access your email? <clears throat> yeah, just give me one second. So sorry. Okay. So, so I just want to be, so this is the one that we sent yep. uh, for the- This is the one we sent on Thursday. So, right. so um, sorry, folks. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. And if you have any additions to that, you know. We, you know. we don't, but it just so happens that I think a couple of weeks ago, um, Josephine sent over a, a handful of sites too. So um, so we, we weren't sure which ones to respond to. Um, if you guys have any questions in the meantime, while we pull this up, we can. I'm just very pleased that our community board has been, um, we've been very fortunate to get all of this funding in. You know, our parks are one of our treasures in the neighborhood and um, to be able to renovate them and and make them fresh, as you say, and you know, it, they really get a lot of use, and and it's encouraging uh, that we are able to, um, to to get the funding to do this. And we certainly thank everyone, especially our, our city councilman Justin Brandon, yeah, um, because he really advocates for us. And yeah, people. We have we have a pretty good state senator too. I'll just say that as well. Um, <laughs> who's, who's helping get some funding, um, like specifically on our on our on our bikeway. Um, we're going to be looking. Uh, we worked on a project called Destination Greenways, uh, and we're going to be looking at I think the first phase of that, which is a portion of Leaf Erickson Park to figure out um, some paths and lighting. I think we're just trying to figure out if it's in our if, if all the money is in our budget yet enough for us to start the project um, and when that would be. I have. Yeah, Barbara, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Or yeah, we'll, I... we'll, maybe we'll do Barbara and then Terry, I also see that you have your hand up as well. Okay, so you can hear me, good. Yes. Um, so I, I have a couple of um, questions. Um, I live on 95th and Shore, mm -hmm. right by the ramp that was done a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of those plantings have not done well. Um, I know there was a pandemic. I know that there is an issue with the parks department in terms of maintaining things once they're in. But I'm wondering if we couldn't do some more indigenous plantings, things that would not need maintenance, because it seems like such a waste to put in all the beautiful plants only to have them die because they're not maintained properly. Yeah, well, I, I can, if I can jump in here, um, you know, so when our, when we have our designers design, do landscape designs, they are picking from a natural plant palette or sorry, a, a native plant palette um, and the whole the whole feedback that we give them is to try to reduce the amount of um, labor that's required to maintain it. So these are kind of the lowest maintenance possible. Um, I think over the summer we did have uh, kind of a phenomenal stretch of no rain, uh, which didn't help our, our plant friends. Um, so when, when we do put in plants, we are thinking about these things. 
Um, Chris, if you want to chime in, feel free. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, we just don't have that many staff members. I, I don't know, Chris, do you know how many gardeners you have for all of District 10? I, 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 um, I, I, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, cool. That's okay. Barbara, go ahead. Um, yeah, I had been in touch with, um, uh, I can't, I'm blocking his name, but it's the gentleman who kind of runs the parks department for our area. And he did say that he had minimal staff. That was a big issue. Um, I do know that with um, the plantings that we have, there were a lot of ornamental grasses. And, and although I agree with you that the drought this year was awful, the, the problems pre- Definitely preceded yeah. the drought. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I'm just thinking if as a community board and as you know a group, if we can't think more about stewardship and kind of make sure that we get the most bang for our buck and plants that are gonna um, be hardy, because in my my experience, ornamental grasses don't do so well because <laughs> we planted them at our place in Pennsylvania and they really did not do well at all. Yeah. So, um, well, I think, I think the other thing here is, you know, if we can try to explore what options there are to kind of replant the, the hillside, um, it would be a bigger project that's kind of beyond just district 10 scale. So it would be something we need to coordinate and maybe even get extra funding expense funding for, yeah. um, I don't know, Chris, did you want to hop in? Yeah, so um, one issue I know particular with the, the plantings on the ramp is that a lot of them were choked out by invasives. Mm -hmm. um, mugwort in particular really just took over the whole hillside. Um, yeah. And there was another, another plant uh, one of the gardeners mentioned to me that had really taken over uh, big time this year. And it just, they, that stuff really just chokes out um, so many of the native plants. Um, you know, just because a plant is, is native doesn't mean it's going to outcompete, um, you know, a really strong and uh, determined invasive. Right. Um, as far as uh, number of gardeners we have in the district, that number is uh, currently zero. Um, so we've been reliant on the central gardeners uh, coming out of Prospect to, to do all of our district needs, uh, which is one reason why you guys might not have seen um, necessarily spe super speedy responses um, on your gardening requests to the, to the agency in the area. Um, another thing that we're, we sort of try to do that goes sort of dovetails with the capital thing is in a lot of these newer areas we do try and put in irrigation systems where possible which also you know cuts back on just you know staff having to go out and manually water or like leaving things to chance with like where uh davy said you know we had that huge such no rain which is going to really negatively affect affect new plants in particular so um the irrigation is something we do try and put in where possible and you know, financially feasible. Um, my, my other related question before you, you knock me off is, is it possible for us to do anything with sheep or goats in terms of like dealing with the vegetation? I know they did that in Riverside Park and they're doing it um, on Roosevelt Island. They did it in Prospect as well. It was actually really cool to see them do that. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, Davey, how's the goat contract holding up? I, that's something <laughs> yeah. I've followed too closely. I mean, I think if we're, if we're having trouble hiring gardeners, I don't think uh, our <laughs> goat budget is that big either. But, <laughs> um, but no, but in serious, you know, I think it is a, it's a, it's a good tool. They've done it in, I know they've done it in Brossway Park and Riverside and, and Governor's Island um, in spaces where it allows, and it, I think it, it can be effective. Um, it can also, but it also requires staff to let those goats out and show them the right places to work too. So, um, we so, actually had to guard the goats at, yeah. at one point in prospect. I remember when I was in parks enforcement, we used to have to go check on them at night <laughs> to make sure no one was stealing them. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there are lots of external factors with that but um you know it's, it's another reason why we're, we're advocating for the one percent of the park budget um you know I'm, as for those tracking the news you know we're, we're every agency is looking at budget cuts right now we've been told that our personnel budget is is safe maybe because it was so small to begin with but um you know um we're we're going to be looking for ways to to 
kind of shave off our budget and get leaner um, if we can. Let's, um, Terry, you have yeah. your hand up for quite a while. Yeah. Hi, um, two things. You should be reassured that the work that you did on the, um, the courts at Fort Hamilton really paid off. As soon as they were open to the public, they were jammed. People were playing basketball, people were playing tennis. It was really great to see and with the work that was already done on the field, you know, with the, uh, the track. I, I was working the election um, two months this summer and it was, it just felt so vital. So you should feel really good about that. Um, the other thing is with planting, can we move toward doing pollinator plants, native pollinator plants rather than grasses? They tend to be pretty hardy if you're putting in stuff like asters and milkweed and it would support bees and butterflies rather than just looking ornamental. Yeah, I might. Chris, do you do you have any thoughts on on that? I mean, I'm all for that. And honestly, I mean, you know, I'm not on the design end of things, but, um, you know, it seems to be a trend that has been steadily increasing over the last few years. Uh, you know, we're looking at things that are um, again, native and also um, less ornamental, more functional to support, you know, wildlife pollinators and, and, you know, native birds and things of that nature. So. And they're pretty, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you get nice color and yeah. the bees and butterflies need all the help they can get. They definitely I think, do. I think the, the other factor in it is just the maintenance of it to make sure that these, these stay alive. I think some of the grasses are you know, maybe easier to maintain or end or easier to replace once they, once they fail. So, um, I, I, um, I've been doing a photography project for a few years with, uh, National Wildlife Federation, which partnered with, uh, national parks and they've been putting in pollinator habitat out at Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, out at Floyd Bennett Field, and also have been working with schools and the schools have been growing the plants that they then plant. And that something that I think could happen in this community. I think we have school gardens. I think teachers would be open to it. So it would solve some of the plant supply problem maybe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Leo Dan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to <clears throat> ask a question. Um, it's not related to the capital projects that you, that you have presented, although I, I want to congratulate the team. I think it's really exciting to see all the work that is kind of on the pipeline for Rivella Rice, uh, you know, reamping and uh, bringing up the parks uh, that we have in our community up to, up to speed. Um, I have a question regarding like um, street treats and <clears throat> And what exactly is the mechanism or if there's a mechanism to get trees replanted in, in areas where they, there's clearly tree wells, but they're missing, um, especially on commercial streets? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we get, I probably commune more 10 is one of the ones we get the most tree questions about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just because I think you guys have such a, uh, an amazing tree canopy at the moment, you know, uh, being a, a older neighborhood with, with those trees. Um, there are ways to request a tree. Um, 311 actually is a very easy way to put in a request in. Um, probably the more difficult thing is where your request goes once it comes in. Um, I think um, in the, so what we do, we don't have in-house forces that do the street tree planting. Um, what we do is we, um, we contract that work out. Um, and in the last year, we've actually had to um, cancel two contracts because they've had some uh, Department of Investigation issues. And those were some of our main contractors that just kind of, I, I don't know exactly what they did, but um, we, we had to cancel those contracts. So that procurement cycle to get new contracts up and running uh, takes a little bit of time. Um, so, what, and so one, so I guess the first thing is it, it, it happens through a contract. Um, once you put a request in for a tree, mm -hmm. um, it can take a couple, sometimes a couple years um, for, for it to actually make its way into a contract and then a contractor to show up at, 
at the site actually installing it. Um, I think the other thing is we have block pruning contracts that take care of trees. Um, and those, those block pruning contracts happen, I think they were happening on about a seven year cycle, which is better than the industry standard. Um, they are only for certain classes of residential properties. I don't think they will service like commercial corridors in the same way. Um, but they, that, that's basically how we maintain our trees on, on, on the streets. Um, and additionally, I think the other factor that gets factored in here is that um, once, um, once they get tangled up into the wires, if there's any overhead wires that, that tree, trees get entangled with, mm -hmm. um, then we actually call in our partners at Con Ed to address it because our in-house forces can only address tree tree pruning um, kind of in like emergency situations. So maybe, I don't know, over the last 24 hours, there might've been a couple of cases uh, with the crazy winds and rain that we got. Um, but um, if, if it does get entangled into the wires, it can either happen on a block pruning contract that we have, or it's a, a kind of someone will come out and send their foresters. Um, I, 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 I've been um, made aware of a particular situation where someone, a homeowner's um, insurance contract is not being renewed because the the tree kind of overhangs over the roof and because of the terrible weather that we've had, we've been having in the winds, like you noted, um, the, you know, there's, there's, there's a real threat of the, of the tree falling, um, yet Parks is not going to take care of that. Right. So, I mean, I think I would say the, the first thing that I'll, I'll start, I think the most important thing to start with is, is the tree restitution costs. Um, so we hold the agency, uh, the agency or homeowners or anyone across the city, if you cut down a tree, you're liable for the restitution costs um, if, it, if it wasn't pre uh, approved to come down. Um, so the last thing we want is a homeowner to go out, take a saw, cut down a tree, and then be on the hook for thousands of dollars uh, in trees. Tens of thousands of dollars. It, it is thousands of I mean, like, we're... It's Some a lot capital of money. projects, we've, we've had to, we've lost millions out of our budget just because we have to pay tree restitution on some, some projects. So I'd say that's the, that's the starting point is the tree restitution that you want to avoid. Um, the, the homeowner in, your, in that case, Diane, kind of has two options. I think the first is that they can wait for a block pruning contract to come along um and 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 address it but they could be waiting for years um if if they want to do it on their own they can go out and procure a contractor they can get a um a forestry permit that would allow them to trim the tree um all at their own cost and then they can file a claim with the comptroller's office so in a case where you know if it's home insurance versus, you know, waiting a couple of years, they might want to make that decision on their own. I don't want to speak mm -hmm. for them on what they should do. Um, you know, and then I think the last, the last way to look at it is kind of emergency situations where, um, you know, it's a storm, a tree falls or a major limb is damaged. And we have a, you know, a limited amount of uh, forestry, trained forestry experts uh, that will come out, assess the problem, and um, and address the tree situation. Um, in the past, it used to be whichever tree gets the most complaints about will handle first. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that anymore. Um, now we're on a, uh, a system called risk management, where um, if there's, you know, in the case of that homeowner, they might send ask a forest a parks forester to come out and assess the tree. Um, we'll look at it based on risk. So. You know, if the tree is kind of dangling over a playground and the limb is cracked, obviously that's a high priority because it could be a risk. Um, if there are a couple branches on a small tree that are kind of brushing next to someone's garage, that's going to be less of a risk. Um, I am sure no homeowner, want, homeowner wants to hear that their tree is not a risk. And, you know, to every homeowner, the tree next door is probably a risk. So um, for them to hear that it's probably doesn't meet park standards of risk is probably not, um, doesn't comfort them. 
Um, but if, if they want, I think they should get that. It sounds like they've already had the, the parks department come out and assess it, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think if it's a, if it's a serious issue that, that their insurance isn't going to certify, maybe they can, um, you know, look to, to means to address it on their own through a certified forester, you know, or. Thank you know. for the clarification. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank yeah. That's thank okay. you. So shall we go through some of these, um. Yeah, I, I've got it on my screen and, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll just share it right now. So um, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Can everybody see my screen right now? Yep. You should be seeing Community Board 10. Uh... All right. Okay. Does everybody see John Paul Jones on the screen? Yes. All right, great. Okay, so John Paul Jones. So um, this would be, we know that the, the pads and the benches are just tired. You know, you can see the ruts that are already in it, um, the, the flooding that occurs, and then kind of the buildup of sedimentation um, that happens afterwards. Um, I can see, uh, just, one, just a Zoom question for you guys. I can see you guys on my screen. I don't know if you can see yourselves too. So I'm just going to maybe minimize that. So just in case, um, so we don't get any crossover. Um, so anyways, yeah, this, so to do all the paths and, and the reason the price tag is so big on this is because it is hex block pavers that we would try to replace it with. Um, it's also to redo all those drainage structures underground. Um, so I'm not sure if John Paul Jones is connected to the, the sewer system or if it goes to dry wells, um, but um, it, whatever we do would be cleaning those out and or reconstructing them as needed um, to, to move things forward. So that's John Paul Jones. Uh, the next one is Diker Bay 8th. Um, so I think um, the next phase is to redo all four of the handball courts. Um, can everyone, does everyone know kind of where we're looking at right now? You can picture it, Acropsy and I guess Poly Place. Um, so the, the, the next phase of this, and I think the previous phases address some of the, the, the ball fields, uh, would be to reconstruct those handball courts, um, you know, bring brand new water service with a bottle filler drinking fountain, new, brand new seating, brand new benches, completely redo the sidewalks upgrade the fencing because it's very old and tired. And then I think for the big, the, the asphalt area over here would be to, um, to introduce uh, a, a, a skate area um, for skateboarding. Um, the next phase uh, would be this area in purple. And that would just be to completely redo um, the playground. Um, so, you know, the playground's just tired. It's the older style equipment. We would try to upgrade it for, you know, the today's, today's model, the 2022 and beyond model. Um, so the playground is about 6 million, kind of about 6 million each, depending on what the final program would be. Um, all right. Okay. And then this one is, um, this, this is the ball field at, Shore Road by 95th um, to redo it in um, just as it is in natural turf um, would be, we're looking at about a field of this side. I know it's a big number. It was about $10 million. Um, what they do is they would, they would dig up the ground. They would uh, replace all the, the dugouts, uh, all the, the backstops, um, bring in new water service with a bottle filler, accessible water fountains, um, storage area for clay, uh, for the ball fields. Um, and then I think, um, help to do some of the perimeter pavement on the, on the shore road side as well. Um, the option B that we have below is just to do the same in synthetic turf. Uh, what synthetic turf does is kind of similar to our bioswale retention tank conversation earlier. All the synthetic turf fields today are, are essentially just a, a large detention tank. So all the water that would fall in the field and can capture some from adjacent areas um, would, um, would be captured into the field, stored, and then kind of 
disperse later on. So I know there is a synthetic turf field nearby already. So there is kind of a benefit for, for natural turf. So depending on what the community was feeling and what actually finally got funded would, would determine that. Um, okay, also at Shore Road, um, this is, um, I'm sure that the community board sees a lot of requests about this, uh, the building um, but between 3rd and 4th Avenue. Um, this is a very old building. Um, it is just kind of not set up in a, in a really good way. So I think one plan under this plan, we got a price to what it would take to demolish it and kind of restore that hillside into an area that, you know, I think protects the hillside and, and can work a little better. That's $10 million just to take that building down. Um, and then for us to rebuild a new compensation lower in the park, maybe closer to the tennis courts, um, would be six million dollars. So that's that's the price for that at the moment. I know those are pretty staggering numbers. So um, let's see. Let's go next slide. Um, Russell Patterson, this is to to kind of finish the project off. Um, to just do that one basketball court and to do the other two uh, the other two sides of the handball wall courts um, would be about $2 million. We, when we did that, we would also upgrade all the drainage. We would do all new, brand new fencing. Um, and it would really kind of, it would pop as a fully new park with, especially with the, uh, the new playground design that's down below. Um, I'll just say, I don't know if anyone's asking, but um, conversation costs are about to build a brand new conversation. Um, would be about $4 million. That's kind of what they've been coming in at. To restore an existing one is slightly less, um, but it's still in the millions um, amount, and especially one like the one at Russell Peterson that's a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, that's a blank sheet. Um, I, go. I don't know why it's showing up blank. I think the information- Stryker Beach Park. Yeah, I don't, uh, let me stop sharing and see if I can um, get it to work. Sorry about that, guys. Does it strike anybody else as insane that it costs less to build an entire house than it does to build a comfort station in a park? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could build a two-story house with multiple bathrooms and a full kitchen. I mean, we could buy the house across the, the, the street and turn it into a public bathroom for less sometimes. I mean, yeah. it's, have you guys uh, looked into doing modular? We, we have looked into Comfort doing modular. Station. I think it's, uh, we've done them in Coney Island. Uh, we have um, a couple projects where we've tried them out. I think um, it's just, you know, we're not picking the prices on these. It's just, you know, for, for a contractor to actually do these buildings, um, it's about the same amount of um, oversight and, and um, paperwork that's required, if not more, for a contractor to do a whole brownstone. So um, it's, it's kind of a thing we've been grappling with at the agency for a number of years now, um, but I'm not sure there's a good answer. Chris, did you want to say something? I mean, 10 million, uh, yeah. 10 million to demo a building. Yep. Yep. I mean, all that brick has to go somewhere and it's, it's probably old and, you know, so we, we don't know what's in those bricks as well. So, you know, like all of that has to get put onto trucks and driven to a landfill. So if you can imagine taking that apart brick by brick and then throwing it into something and then you know, redoing the hillside project, which when we did other parts of Shore Road, you know, those those prices came in pretty pretty steep as well. So, um, yeah, I would imagine a lot of that is caught up in the reconstruction of the hill itself, not just the demolition and guarding. Yeah. But right, because it's it's also an engineered retaining wall that you'd have to put back in to hold the sidewalk in place and to manage all the soil and and infill. So it is quite. It's probably not the top need uh, for the district, but. Um, you know, we know that we do get a lot of questions about the building. And you're going to need some sort of drainage there as well, too. So, I mean, that there's a lot going on there. Um, I was going to say, as far as the comfort station goes, I know one option that's sort of being 
potentially piloted in the district is the is the pay um the pay toilets yeah, i can speak to um, that yeah yeah i think um you know we've also <clears throat> partnered with dot so dot has done this automated pay toilet system so on the in the public right away where there's their space um they are trying to push um you know i think think commercial corridors um, where a bathroom might be needed, um, they would install, um, you know, a freestanding comfort station, basically, but you pay to enter. There's one at um, Grand Army Plaza has one. Um, and then I think a couple of sites in Manhattan as, as well. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you know them all. Uh, I, well, I, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the one that's on Flatbush at Grand Army Plaza, yeah. Um, yeah. by the, across from the library. Yeah. Um, I think if we try and get one here. I think we were looking at down by the pier. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that was the site we sort of had in mind if we do pilot one here, so. Yeah. I, I know that. Think... Move along. Um, if I just wanted to address, Justin, you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, is that because it's already like you're working with a mandated contractor through the city or would there be like a bidding war on that? No, so I mean, it, they're they're, we, we open up, you know, part of our reason our procurement job process takes so long is that, you know, we, we review all the contracts. That, so basically, I'll, I'll walk through the capital project process a little bit. So once we have a scope meeting, come to the community board with a, with a design, that design gets, once we get the approval from the community board, our design staff kind of goes and, um, starts to look at all the details and kind of puts all of the aspects of a design into what's called a contract book. So it's, you know, like all the doors, all the, all the bits and pieces, you know, how much excavation is needed, what kind of any specialty things for the site. Um, once that's put in a book, it's reviewed by the law department. Um, and then once it goes through all of its legal kind of checkovers, then it's actually put out to bid to the public. Um, so anyone can, in theory, bid on a, a project. I think to be a, a registered uh, bidder, you have to be registered in Vendex, um, which is a city kind of bidder tracking system. Um, we we try to take, um, we try to prioritize MWBE uh, vendors or, or contractors um, where we can. Um, I think we actually have one of the better records among among agencies for hiring MWBE staff uh, or contractors. Um, and then so once that happens, then the contract's finalized and then it can go into construction. So that's a very long-winded way of answering like, no, it's, it's uh, it, these are all publicly bid projects. It just happens that, you know, I think the process for working with the city and working with, um, you know, the designs that we have are so just take a long time and there's a lot of, you know, it takes, a, it takes them a lot longer to get paid than if they did a private job. There's a lot of paperwork that has to be done with the city. They still have to get Department of Building approvals um, on all their and sign offs and et cetera. So oftentimes I think it's, contractors end up padding their contracts a little bit to prepare for those headaches that, you know, inevitably happen with the city and just to, defend the city briefly, you know, we're doing all those approvals and, and oversight because we want to make sure that we're, what we're putting out on the public in the public right away is going to be safe and it's going to last. So it, it, there is a bit of, there is a reason to the madness at the end of the day, but um, unfortunately the, the price that we get, we don't pick the prices. It's just kind of what's coming in. Thank you. Uh, Leo, Dan. Yeah, just to pile on, I had, uh, I guess, a question or an observation is one, could could you guys like uh, comp uh, put this project with another bigger project so that it, instead of like giving this, you, you mentioned that contractors obviously have to do a lot of paperwork and, and um, a lot of oversight just for such a little project, if there's an opportunity to put, put this with another bigger project so that um, it could reduce the price because it would be part of the same management um, uh, contract management aspect. Yeah, we, we, we've tried to do that with a couple of our, we've definitely done it with our landscape sites just because there's, there's a little simpler. So the ones like um, Quaker Parrot Field 
um, is, is one of these, what we call group contract, where it's a number of sites and it's kind of limited scope. Um, also, you know, with our green infrastructure projects and our state of good repair projects, we do that as well. Um, I think with the buildings, it's just a little bit trickier to, to kind of group them all together. Um, and I don't think you, uh, we, we just haven't been able to do it in the same way. I think we've tried some pr contracts and it just hasn't worked out. We haven't gotten, because the other thing we have to do is to get good bidders as well, you know, to respond to it. So, mm -hmm. okay. I think it's also harder to secure a larger amount of funding that making it a larger project would do. It, it's sort of easy to get, you know, smaller, smaller things funded right away than to say, oh, we're going to do a $50 million project. It's sometimes it's just easier to do 10, $5 million projects than one $50 million project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and would some kind of a renovation become in like cheaper? And I'm looking at, at it in Google Earth right now, and I see a lot of the issues are accessibility to this thing seems to be kind of obviously from a different generation, like stairs are kind of coming up to, to meet the side that are obviously not accessible. Uh, but in any cases, like saving something from this building and doing like an overhaul renovation of it to could potentially be a lot cheaper than, you know, Demol demolishing the building, dealing with retention and, and all that, um, as you guys were mentioning. Yeah, there, there, there's definitely a possibility of maybe doing like a smaller scale project, bringing it up to um, today's uh, ADA codes. You know, that's definitely an option. I mean, I think if you approach it from the bottom, I think the, the entrances to the bathroom are these kind of very claustrophobic um, corners that you have to turn to get in there. So um, it, it, it spirals staircase yeah, essentially exactly. the bottom and the top it, it's so. it's like the furthest thing from being ada compliant yeah i've seen i think i have a picture of my my grandmother and my aunt there in like 1951 or two oh, probably that's... right after it was just built and they're on the swing set where the dog where the dog where the dog room was. was yeah that used yeah. to be a playground yeah so like probably all of that was brand new at the time and like you know uh, they used to live on Marine Avenue, so um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, pull us back to if we have two more. Um, yeah, if uh, Diane, it's not working on my computer, so would okay. you mind just? So uh, this one says Geiger Beach Park at 14th Avenue and 86th Street. The total cost of this is thirty million dollars, and it would include Phase One reconstruct synth uh, synthetic turf field and main entrance. Uh, oh, that was. I'm sorry, this is uh, phase one and phase two were completed already. So this is introducing phase three, which is $11 million, completely reconstruct three turf baseball fields, drainage, fencing, sidewalk, dugouts, bottle filler, seating, clay, and team storage. And phase four would be $12 million, convert two part synthetic field back to natural turf, or eliminate clay and make a multi-purpose all synthetic turf baseball and soccer field. Oh, you found it. And I, I got it. I just closed it and opened it again. Yeah, and phase five is the six million. Uh, completely reconstruct the playground for all ages and abilities, replace backboards on basketball hoops. Yep. So I think you did a great job. Just want well, to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the area in green, I think so. Let's start with what was done. So the um, the the first phase is to uh, is to reconstruct this. I guess it's phase one and phase two. So phase one was the, the reconstruct this field in synthetic turf. We did that, and I think it's uh, popular beyond our expectations. Um, I'll just put it that way. Um, the then the other phase two is this multi-purpose play area that. Uh, or asphalt area. Uh, and that's what we showed earlier. It actually also includes these basketball courts as well. Um, so that we, we've handled the asphalt and those will also get like a, um, well, those will also get the underground retention uh, tank that we mentioned earlier in the call. Um, the other thing, so going on to phase three here, these three, um, um, these three baseball baseball fields, they're they're just heavily used. They're tired. Um, they could use a, a facelift. Um, so just to reconstruct them back into natural turf uh, would be eleven million. I 
you know, those prices are, are pretty high, but in the process, we'd also do all the drainage. We'd repair the fence um, that's along the street front. Um, and then also, you know, adding other amenities back and bring it up to kind of today's standards with, uh, with new seating, new clay store, clay and, and storage for team gear. Um, we, we'd have bottle fillers and water fountains. Um, so, you know, pulling all the water lines for that um, would be part of that project. Um, phase four, I think it's um, phase four, these two fields, this is, um, Marty can probably speak to this way better, um, but these two fields were put in, so it's kind of when we were testing out the limits of what synthetic turf could do. So we installed kind of these synthetic turf based, kind of hybrid synthetic turf, natural turf fields. And um, I think like ha Fort Hamilton High School before it, um, th they kind of just haven't worked as we expected. Um, I think there are weeds growing out of the, the turf from time to time. So I think it's figuring out what, what we'd want to do. So, you know, either converting those two parts in the turfs back to fully natural turf or to eliminate the clay bits of it completely and just redo these two areas as, you know, a big rectangular uh, multi-purpose synthetic turf field um, that could be used for soccer or it could be used for baseball, football, um, any type of rectangular sport lacrosse um, in the future. So there are lots of options. I think we'd have to do some searching with the community and the elected official for what would be the priority. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that these these uh, these two baseball fields are past their their lifetime, and then the last aspect is the six million dollars for just redoing the playground uh, where it is. Um, I think in this one we were thinking maybe a playground for all ages and abilities, so we can kind of tailor um, play equipment to you know kids with um, sensory um, sensory. Uh, sensitive to, to sense stimulation and, and whatnot. Maybe think you can picture someone with autism, um, you know, so sometimes there are areas in playground that are not ideal for those people. Um, so we're, we're doing one in Kelly Park um, in, in District 15 at the moment. So um, there are lots of options for playground, but whatever it would be, we think about 6 million would cover it. So that's, I'll, I'll leave that there and I'll go on to the next slide. But all told, thirty million is what we're looking at. Okay, and then this one, I think this this is the last slide we have. Um, but this is just for Shore Road um, and the, and the sidewalks along Shore Road specifically. We get a lot of requests for people for we know that the condition of the hex block pavers and, and the benches um, are not in good shape. So what we asked our capital division to do was to actually price out what it would take for, um, for us to address it. Um, so here you can see the different, the different sections um, uh, and what their prices are. So, um, sorry for my pop-ups. Um, so from, you know, you, you can see the prices on the screen. If you have any questions on it, let me know. I'm happy to, to discuss them. Uh, but we're looking at, you know, to do all these sections total, um, it would be a $13 million ask. Um, and that's, that's it. And I think we probably have to update this, this image because I think we have um, money from both the Senator and council member Goldman on it. So, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll tweak it to make sure that the numbers are right before sending it back over. Okay, sounds um, great. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if that's all right. Sure. Um, and if you guys have any questions, just... Uh, this is great. All we need is money. Yeah. <laughs> like if we yeah. all played the lottery. <laughs> yeah. Why? Yeah. So everyone buy your lotto tickets tomorrow <laughs> or mega yep. millions or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan, did you have? Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, if there aren't any questions, I want to thank everyone from the parks department for this outstanding presentation. Really, really good. Um, there's a lot to think about. I know that we will address these issues um, uh, within the community board, with the executive board, et cetera. Um, and, um, and we look forward to additional projects. Um, I don't know, anyone else want to share anything?
No, thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Really thank good. you very much. Yeah, it was I, spot on. Yeah. <laughs> it was really, thank really you. good. So thank you. thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. And I will be um, typing up this report and submitting it to the district office um, for <laughs> presentation at our next monthly meeting. I just, Thank you. I just, I just want to say, say thanks to Chris and uh, his whole crew, in, including his, his smallest staff right there. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, just, I mean, Chris, Chris is dealing with a lot in his district. You know, there's not, you know, we kind of explained that there's, fewer than one gardeners because there's zero gardeners out there to help them. So, you know, all those people have to come from remotely. He's had issues with various different garbage packers falling apart, breaking out, the person calling out sick, the one driver he has calling out sick, you know, all that, it, it kind of every single, um, every single plague kind of falling on him throughout the year. So I just want to say thank you to Chris and all the job he's doing. Um, and as well to Jim for, for putting together all those presentations. Um, Jim had a big week with, if you can imagine putting these presentations for every single community board in Brooklyn, it's it's a lot of work. So thank you. TV10 is the best community board, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah. thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jim. And Davey, thank you as well. All right. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Everybody. It was nice to meet you guys. Yep. Same good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you good night. Already. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothy. Thank you. Good night, Diane.